right. Good afternoon, Dr. Leitze. Um, how are you doing this evening? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Doing well, thanks. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? My name is Priscilla Leitze, and I have a doctorate in physical therapy and a master's in special education. And I have a special certification that is HPCS, which is a hippotherapy clinical specialist. So I am a pediatric physical therapist, although I do see some adults, but my primary method of working with folks is to partner with the horse and let the movement of the horse work on balance, equilibrium, and other, and, and, and on functional goals. Oh, and one other thing is I work in Texas, but I also started a nonprofit in Beijing, China, where we also do equine assisted services. Perfect. That sounds awesome. Um, so that'll actually be kind of the focus of the conversation this evening is your time uh, in China and sort of the international experiences that you have from that. Okay. So uh, the first question that we have for you is, what is something that you would like the rest of the world to know about PT and or healthcare in China? I would like to, that's a good question. And what I was thinking is how it was different possibly than the way we do things here. I would like to say that it is considered a value in my limited experience, it was um, considered a valuable part of rehabilitation, just the same as here. When I first moved there in this spring in um, January of 2006, I began to work with a large hospital. It's called um, the China Rehabilitation and Research Center. And it's under the, it's called the China Disabled Persons Federation. This hospital falls under their, their structure and I discovered that they, they, their hospital is very similar to ours. They are a developing country, or at least at that time they were. And so some of their equipment might not have been the newest thing that we had here, but all of their techniques were very similar to the kind of things that we have here. And I was struck by the fact that there was a physical therapist and a doctor at this hospital that wanted to learn about hippotherapy. So even in 2006, when the United States was still not receptive or very receptive to the idea of partnering with the horse and using equine movement to help facilitate functional goals, there were people in China that were open to this. So I found that really encouraging. I thought that was really a good thing. I see a lot of differences between China and us. And again, I think it might come from the fact that they're still learning and developing. In China, you need a bachelor's of science to be a physical therapist. So they're still having a different model. But having said that, even in 2006, when I was working with the PT, and at that time, I couldn't speak any Chinese. I can speak a little bit now, but just like a three-year-old. But I know a lot of PT terms and a lot of horse terms. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have to say that it was really just like this. It was just this wonderful, fun experience to be working with another PT. And even though we couldn't necessarily communicate verbally, we got it when it came to the person on the horse and what was happening with the movement of the horse. So that's something that I just found really unique and really exciting when I worked in China. Very nice. Um, are there any misconceptions surrounding physical therapy or healthcare industries in China? Not that I am aware of. I have to say that they do, so for one, their education system is different. They have a bachelor's as opposed to a master's or a doctorate, but they still want their, their physical therapists still work on the same kind of things that we work here on here. One of the things that I found kind of a challenge was trying to get equipment. So later I can show you a picture because there's a picture of a wheelchair 
but you have to go to a wheelchair market. It's not like someone comes to you and you talk about a particular individual and you you um, work on having that individual getting a wheelchair fit for them. There, you go to a building. When I walked into the building, there was no one else there, so they had to turn on the light on that floor. And there, then there's there's primary there's different sections. There's sports wheelchair, there's adults wheelchairs, and then there's children's wheelchair wheelchairs. So I found that also a, a different model than what we have here. Mm -hmm. Very different. Yeah, it sounds different. And I'm glad you're able to share that with us. Yeah. All right. So next question would be, um, what is a unique attribute uh, or strength that um, a physical therapy in China, something that makes it unique? Well, I found it, um, I thought it was really lovely that even in 2006 that they wanted to do, they were interested in doing hippotherapy or learning about how to do hippotherapy. So other than that, I would say everything else about it is very similar. Like we're working on functional goals and we're working on balance, perhaps walking, sitting, standing, all kinds of things. So I think that in a way, it's kind of comforting to find that they, even though the equipment might have been older equipment, like an older treadmill or things like that, the, the goals are very similar. So I'm not, in my experience, I didn't find a lot of things that were unique, except that they were open to the idea at that time of doing hypotherapy. Okay. And was there any um, kind of universal strengths or pride in the healthcare system in China? Anything else that made that part unique as well? I found that, as I said, it was very lovely. It was just really exciting to be able to work with another PT and even despite the language barrier, we could understand each other. And But I found that um, there were just, things were just done so very differently there than they are here. And that ex one example was like the wheelchair. You have to go to the market, then decide which one you want. And then they would backtrack and then you could fit the individual. But there were things such as at that time, there was not really universal health care. Even then it was not, maybe 50% of the population had it. And now it's more like 95% of the population had it, has insurance. So it, there's a whole different model and they're, they're learning to do things the way that, or they are beginning to practice things the same way that we do here, but it wasn't that always that way over there. So insurance was a, a thing. Okay. Uh, next question we have is what would be a weakness or a challenge for the field of physical therapy in China or the healthcare system as well? So I, I found two. One was the ability to get equipment and properly fit equipment. So I'll show you some slides about that. But as a pediatric PT, even the year before last, I, one of the children I worked with at HOPE, which is the program I established, the, the, the program I established, that um, provides is not at the moment it's just doing adaptive writing there's not a physical therapist there but when i went to every i would go four times a year or three three to four times a year and i saw a child that really needed a reverse walker and he was already getting pt and the pediatric pt was going to his house and he had a walker but i didn't like the walker he had and his mom said we can't find a reverse walker here so we had to i had to I ended up to hand carry a reverse walker from here, like put it in a box and take it over there. And so I found the equipment is the way you get equipment and the type of equipment was a challenge for us. And again, can I, just, I shouldn't say again, but one thing I should say is that as an expat, I might not know all the avenues, but all the avenues that I knew didn't have the type of equipment I wanted. And this parent who was a very, strong advocate for her child and her child did get PT 
she too was having trouble having trouble getting the right kind of equipment. The other thing is, I knew you wouldn't ask me this question, so I had to look it up how to phrase this because one of the unique things about China at the moment is they have something called the classification of hospitals. So not all hospitals are even considered to be equal. They have a grade one, a grade two, and a grade three. So for example, and they have different functions and different roles. So in grade one, it is a community health centers and township health centers that directly provide prevention, medical care, and rehab services. Then there's the grade two, which is a step up. And they provide the same services, but they have a little teaching and a little research. Then there's the grade three, which are provide the same services, but at more advanced levels and they have more advanced teaching and scientific research. So it's a three tier healthcare network. There's some problems with that in that there's an uneven distribution of medical care. So the larger hospitals, and of course I was in Beijing and when I was working with the China Rehabilitation Research Center, that was the one of the top ones. It is the top tier in grade three. So there's an uneven distribution. And so some receive more government subsidies than others. Some have more hospital beds than others. And I even have a friend whose father died. He was at one of the, the grade one and there was no room for him in the hospital. So he needed to spend the night on a plinth in the hallway and he needed medication and they couldn't provide it for him. He ended up taking his own life because it was so, he was in so much pain. And his, his daughter, my friend felt that if he'd had a different hospital, the outcome might've been different. Mm -hmm. So the lower hospital, and the grade might not have the, they have less advanced technology and less resources. So I absolutely know that China wants to fix this problem, but at the moment, I think that's still a problem that they are dealing with. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, the next question that we have on our list is, uh, what role do physical therapists play in interprofessional collaboration in China? I would say very similar to what we do here. You, they are part of a team. And so sometimes there's OT, sometimes there's PT, there's speech, they work with the doctors. So I'd say very much the same as we do here. I do have to say, this is not OT, this is PT. But when I had just moved to China and I'm I had only been there a few months and I'm taking a tour of the hospital and we go into the OT department and um, the people are learning to eat with chopsticks. And I'm like, well, that's, that'd be hard for us in the US, but that's what happens <laughs> in China. So I just thought that was kind of an interesting thing that sometimes we kind of are used to our own culture and our own bubble and nope, other people don't eat with spoons. Some people eat with chopsticks. Yeah, that's something that I would never have thought of. Right. I did feel kind of silly, like I should have thought of that, but no, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So next we have, uh, what lessons can be learned from practicing physical therapy abroad in general? Oh, I love that question. So I think one of the things that we as physical therapists in general, no matter where we're practicing, is we need to remember to be non-judgmental in our approach to the folks that we work with and the caretakers. And I think that that same is true when you are practicing abroad or when you go abroad, just to be non-judgmental. So just because they do things a little different and because their equipment might be not the same as ours, just accept it. Here's the way it is and just work with it. So I think you have to be open to learning and you need to be tolerant and non-judgmental. I don't even mean to say tolerant. I meant to say non-judgmental. And I have to say, one of the funny things is that one time, one of the children was, I put on a horse and he was crying and crying. And they said to me, what are you going to do? What should we do? And I said, I know what we do in the United States, but I, in China, things are different. And 
the way that the family raises a child is different than we do here. So just you need to be aware of the cultural differences and just do your best to learn from the other culture. Very good lesson indeed. Yeah, yeah. it's it's all even and even though you have your doctorate as a physical therapist, and I actually have two master's degree, can I just say, and I think Ted, you know this because you told me how much you have traveled, traveling. And going to other places helps you to be, helps you to understand other folks. And it, it's a real, it's an education in, its, in itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can't really teach that in school. Right, right. Yes, yeah. yeah. And they have, well, actually one of the things when I first went to the hospital in 2006, I went to the restroom and when I left, hmm, there's no soap. Hmm. And so even, I think definitely things have changed since 2006, but like here, I mean, that would have been like, you must, you know, sterile techniques and being careful about those kind of transmission of germs was a thing that we were aware of already at that time. So it's just, it's just a learning curve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up, we've got, how does the patient population view and interact with physical therapy in China? I can only speak to the pediatric population. And in my experience, it was very similar to here. The families that sought PT then obviously wanted it. And then they would work with the PT to help their child to make, gain skills and have perform um, have better function and better mobility. So I really found it very similar in that respect to the way we view it here in the US. Okay. And I believe uh, I have the option set to where you can share those images if you'd like to go through and talk about some of those as well, because uh, I have gone through the questions list so now we can talk about the pictures. Super. Nope, not that one. Sorry. Share screen. Ah, oh, good. Okay. So go. I just have a few pictures of this is meant to show. I have another picture. I don't know if it's the next one. Um, the type of wheelchair is the is the point of this one. So this just happens to be at Hope, which is the organization I started, and it stands for Horses Offering People Enrichment. I know it's not a unique name, Hope is not, but I do believe that horses offer people enrichment. And actually, whether you're in the United States or whether you're over there, I feel that horses can help the folks that we serve make gains faster often than I can do in a clinic. So this is a type of wheelchair. So it's just a frame with wheels on it. So let me see if I can advance to the next one. So here's a side view of it. That is a common type of wheelchair. And as you know, so there's nowhere, there's no trunk supports, which he could really benefit from. And there's no straps for his feet. So, um, and the other thing is that this child comes from a disadvantaged family. They're very financially disadvantaged. So once he outgrew his AFOs, it, he's, he's, he's gonna be without AFOs for a long, long time. So um, that's, their medical system is different in the sense that then we have here in the United States. It's not the same as everyone can apply to Medicare and get or Medicaid and get services and get equipment. So, um, and this is just a picture of the wheelchair market. So all it is is a, is a multi-story building. And as I said, when I went in there, there were no other people in there, no other prospective people to buy things. So they had, they turned the lights out. And when I walked in and they were like, oh, wait, here's, here's a person who might buy something. They turned the lights on. 
And so, um, and so they do make some wonderful wheelchairs. It's just, that I think for that child that I was just showing you, that is a more common type of wheelchair. And also this is in Beijing. And if you live in the surrounding, if you live in a village, you know, if you live in the countryside, you are not gonna, the folks don't have say, the same access to the equipment that you do if you live in a big city like Beijing. And Beijing happens to be the capital. The way I kind of describe Beijing is a little bit like, it's like New York City in that it, New York City is a great place, but it's not really indicative of the rest of the United States. So, so I think Beijing is fabulous. It offers many opportunities for people that may be different if you lived outside or in a smaller city. So here's just how we had to hand deliver the, um, the that's my dear husband right there. He had taken it apart. We put it in a box and we had to hand deliver this um, reverse walker. And here's a picture of him. This child had not been on a walker. That's the same fellow who was in the wheelchair. And he was so excited to, he had actually had the skill of walking for a matter of feet. And then as he grew taller and he doesn't have access to OTPT and speech on a regular basis at all. So he was back to being confined to his wheelchair. He was so excited to walk with this. So that's just some of the stories I have to tell, some of the limitations, but yet some of the positive aspects of things in China. And I think that's my last picture. Oh no, here's one more picture. The other thing is there are a lot of orphans in China. And when I started HOPE, I started it because I was just working with orphans with special needs and I wanted to put them on a horse. So now I'm still working with orphans, but I work, we work with local children and adults as well with special needs. But I'm just showing you another piece of equipment. So this is totally a great standard. It's just that here in the United States, we have standards that when I began the, doing this kind of like 30 years ago, this is the kind of standard we would use. Now we have different standards that are more easy to put. It's easier to put the child in, easier to take the child out and easy, more, it's more mobile. But here you go. Here's a kind of standard that I think, and it's totally functional and um, it works great for this child. And this is actually a school for orphans with special needs, which is just a huge, wonderful thing that that, that school is available in Beijing. It's a small school and it's a private school. So not all kids get that service. And that's the end of my pictures. Oh, thank you for sharing those pictures. It's cool to see all the kids. And I enjoyed the, um, I think there was a chalk drawing of a, a horse and a leader on one of the previous, yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's me, don't you recognize yeah, me? <laughs> got the blonde hair and everything. Exactly. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, yeah, and the other interesting thing that we hadn't talked about is over there you can't drink water from the tap, so you must have um, drink water that comes bottled. So everyone carries their own bottle. Uh, we, often it's hot water because there's a lot of tea, but we must have water available for our participants. And there you go, there's a bottle of, of water. Nice. Do you yeah. find yourself drinking tea a lot more when you came back? I absolutely do. Because before I went, I didn't like tea. Now I drink tea a lot. <laughs> <I> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, those are our pictures. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Are there any other habits you came back from China with? Well, I love Chinese food. I, pr I prefer not to eat meat and it's nothing... It's just because I prefer not to eat meat. And in China, it's very easy to be a vegetarian, you can get wonderful dumplings that just have hatch green chili. They have hatch green chili all year long. So you can get green chili and egg, you can get green chili and all kinds of stuff. So it's super easy to not eat meat and there's tofu all over. So it was really lovely to be able to eat well in China and eat, just have vegetarian food. It was ubiquitous and at least I felt like it was. so. I came back with that. I learned how to use chopsticks and I, do, I actually, now I drink hot water, which is kind of an odd thing, but that's what they do in China. And it's, um, it's just very comforting when you drink hot tea or hot water. 
Very nice. <laughs> yes. yes. Everyone over there walks around with a big thermos of their hot water. Sometimes it's tea, but mostly it's just their hot water. They just drink it. And there's a, there's a legend of how tea began in that one of the emperors many years ago was had his hot water and he fell asleep under a tree and the tree dropped his leaf, the leaves in. He's like, oh, let me try this. And that's how, that's a legend. We're not sure it's true, but how tea came about in China. That's a fun little legend. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it looks like the child's really enjoying his time with the horse there. Isn't he? He really is. So, and I, another interesting thing was that this helmet I he was off the horse so he didn't have it buckled but he definitely does when he's on the horse I brought it from the U.S. well when you're a path center the helmets you must replace your helmets every five years so when it was time to replace that I couldn't buy them in China and so that's there are small things like that that make running program this type of program more of a challenge over there than over here. And over here, you can actually buy portable ramps to put people on the horse. Over there, we had to build our own ramp. So there's small things like that that are not necessarily related to PT, except the ramp actually is. But um, those are just small challenges that you run into when, or I ran into when I was doing this kind of work in China. Yeah, one of the many things that you don't realize that would be different until you actually get there and start doing it. Correct. And I don't know if you remember, Ted, but at Courtney Cares, at our ramp, we had this kind of little real, it, it was, it's ADA compliant, but we didn't have a very big space. So that ramp had to go up, turn a corner and go up a little bit more. So there's no such thing as ADA over there. And so that's another, actually, that's another difference. There's nothing for ADA. And in 2008, when the Olympics came after the regular Olympics, they're the Paralympics. And so people had to make things wheelchair accessible. So they would just make a little device out of wood, like a small ramp, and they'd put it against the curb so that if someone had, was on a wheelchair and on the street and wanted to go up, they could have this little small ramp. And then they would move it after the, two, after the Olympics were gone, they removed it. So none of the, none of the, doors were accessible, none of the toilets were accessible, and there weren't elevators for if you wanted to use the subway system. Since then, they have made, they, there's still no such thing as ADA, but they have made lots of progress towards making elevators accessible and having elevators so that people can get up and down in a wheelchair or if they're mobility impaired to get to, this, to the subway systems. So we at Hope are trying to be the first center to make our center ADA compliant. And we're working towards that because they still have what we call squatty potties, which are just um, toilets that are made, There's, they're porcelain, but you, um, you just go to the potty in the ground. And so for folks with um, disabilities, being able to have a toilet and having an adapted an adapted toilet is really something that is is beneficial. So we at Hope are, are working towards becoming the first center to do that. Oh, that's awesome. I'm sure there's been a lot of challenges in trying to make that goal happen. You were correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and even small things like to become a PATH center, a PATH accredited center, you need to have, um, parking for um, handicapped parking. So we have to ha build signs and designate some parking spaces just for folks that that might be uh, need the handicapped parking. So there's all kinds of small things that I had forgotten about. Even though you sent me my questions, those are small things that I had kind of forgotten about. And I guess for the people who may not be aware, because I don't think we've talked about it yet, could you explain what PATH is? Oh, sure. Sorry about that. Yes, PATH is the Professional Association of Therapeutic Horsemanship International. And in the United States, it's kind of what we call our governing body for equine assisted or adaptive riding and some equine assisted services. So there's adaptive riding and there's adaptive carriage um, 
driving care, driving carriages. So it's for people that want to do work with horses and work with folks with special needs. So they provide us some guidelines in how to train your volunteers, how to train your horses, on your horse welfare, types of equipment, and then they certify individuals to be instructors and they sort of they accredit centers. They make sure that you are ADA compliant. They make sure that things are safe. So they that's what um, that's what we do in the United States. This woman in this picture with the gray hair, my friend Manu, she is RDA certified, which is Riding for the Disabled Association, and it's a similar organization, but it was started in the UK about the same time that PATH started here in 1969. So they provide the same type of services. So. PATH is not the only one. It just happens to be the one we are familiar with here in the United States, most familiar with. Okay. Did you yeah. find yourself working with other international people over in uh, Beijing? A lot. And it was, one, it was one of my favorite things. I mean, it was just one of my favorite things because you learn that the way that we do things is not necessarily the only way to do things. And um, Manu happens to be a very skilled horse person. And... So I learned from her the way she, they do things in France and also her own particular bias. But then I learned I was around people from, you know, Africa and people from Egypt and people from India and people from all over the world. And I, that was one of my favorite things is that I got to learn about, so I, I had a really good friend from Hungary. Like, so I just learned about other cultures as an expat living in China. And that was a really wonderful experience. Again, it, even though I might have been have a strong academic education, I feel like I can learn so much. Just having your doctorate doesn't mean you know it all. I'm learning that myself right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, were there any important lessons that you learned from your colleagues? I'd say we shared that idea of being non-judgmental. And I'd say that's the biggest thing that I, I learned. I also went to a church that was an English speaking church, but it had people from all over the world. And again, I just learned compassion, or I saw compassion and empathy. And it was just a lovely experience. Yes. Yeah. It, one thing I have to say I did learn is it makes you realize how big the world is when you are surrounded by people from all over the world. And when I would go to church on Sunday afternoon and there would be people of all different colors and shapes and sizes from all over the world, you just kind of go, yeah, well, we, yeah, the United States, we're big, but the world is so much bigger. Yes. Yeah. And Beijing, when I got there, Beijing was a city of 18 million people, I think. And by the time I left, it was 22 million people. And I had written an article for the um, Horses in Education and Therapy International, another international organization that deals with equine assisted services. And I had my sister proofread it. And she said, oh, there's a typo. Earlier, you said it was 18,000. Now you say it's 22. I said, no, it's not a typo. It's grown that much. <laughs> so it's just crazy to be in. It's very, very different than being here where we get to have our own house. Over there, most people live in apartments. And then you always are seeing people. And when you, to go to the apartment, when you walk through the gate into the premises of the apartment, they take your picture. There's a light uh, if it's in the evening and they take your picture. As you're driving your car, they take your picture. Your picture is taken a lot in China and Big Brother is watching. But the cute thing is one of my good friends, she works for me, she works for Hope. So now we've been friends many years. And she said, do you get lonely sometimes in Texas? And I said, um, cause I'm married and have kids and I have a horse and I'm like, and I work and I'm, and I'm like, um, no, why do you ask? She said, because there aren't so many people. And I'm like, okay, well, then there you go. <laughs> because in China, you always see people. So I thought that was a really cute thing and an interesting observation. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah. 
Well, that is, that is all the questions that I had prepared and I love the conversations that we had as well. It was definitely very enlightening for me and I hope that it will be enlightening for everyone else too. Well, I appreciate this opportunity because I, I really like China and I feel like the people there, all of our friends, my, my husband and I and our kids, we have really good friends and they're just really good people. They just might do things differently than us. And so it really pained me during this past year when people would say disparaging things about Asian folks, because all the Asian folks I know are pretty, pretty great and I appreciate them. And they, they're over there running hope at the moment and helping kids with special needs. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that they were, people were saying the bad things though. that's never fun to hear. It's not, but yeah. yeah. But thank you for this opportunity. This was really fun and it was, it was nice to see you. It was good to see you too. And thank you for coming on and sharing all your experience with us. I really do appreciate it. And I'm sure yeah. everyone who watches this will appreciate it too. I hope it, I hope it, I hope I was able to articulate what I was attempting to say. So I just hope it went okay. <laughs> yeah, I think you did a great job, Dr. Lightsey. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'd love seeing you, Ted. And let me know when you, when you are in Texas, where, where are you in Texas? Where's your family? Let me go ahead and hit the stop recording real quick.